born in McKinney, Texas on Christmas Eve. I was a preemie baby, weighing three pounds, and slept in an incubator for many weeks. The nurse that cared for me, she prayed and sang hymns over me, and my dad believed it was a miracle that I survived. McKinney was the perfect small town, and I had the perfect early childhood. My family attended church regularly, and I can't remember a time that I did not believe in God and Jesus. My perfect childhood changed when I was 12. Our family decided to move to Dallas. That was a very sad day for me. We attended church for a few months, and then suddenly we just stopped going. My parents moved into separate bedrooms and fought all the time. During junior high and high school, I experienced some additional emotional trauma that caused me to become very introverted, which for those who know me, you know that doesn't seem possible. <laughs> but I was very introverted. After I graduated from high school, my parents divorced. They struggled financially, and due to my emotional trauma, I found a job and began drifting through life with toxic people. I knew I couldn't concentrate on college, and so that was my choice in my life. However, at age 20, my life radically changed. I was flipping through the TV channels and landed on the Billy Graham crusade. I tried to change to a different channel, but the remote would not change. <laughs> Billy Graham's words started speaking to me, and I realized that even though I had always believed in God, I needed to allow Jesus to change my heart and life. In the months that followed, Jesus became the counselor that I never had when I was in junior high and high school. I started loving people. I started becoming very friendly and an extreme extrovert, <laughs> which I am today. And uh, that was what God intended me to be. One day I was on the balcony of my aunt's high-rise apartment, and there was this beautiful church steeple might be coming up. It reminded me of my church in McKinney. I decided to attend the singles Bible study, and there was this tall, handsome guy there carrying a large black Bible. <laughs> Who was that? Ah, I no imagine. idea. Uh, his name is Bran Wall. <laughs> and I would marry him a year later. There he is. A lot of hair. Yeah, he had a lot of hair. Uh, my life verse today, it changes uh, periodically. It's in 2 Corinthians 9, 15. Now thanks be to God for his indescribable gift, which is precious beyond words. And I would say our painful life experiences become very small when we see the vast suffering of Christ on the cross. Amen. My testimony is that I'm, I'm grateful that I grew up in a Christian home and a Baptist home. And uh, most of my life right here in Houston, I uh, went to Spring Branch Elementary and Springwoods Junior High. And uh, that's unfortunately where I met Philip at all, <laughs> Steve. We were in choir together, Tellerwood Baptist Church. And when I was in high school, the big deal was for people with uh, prior drug pasts to come speak at your high school. And they, they overcame this awesome drug addiction and they were celebrated. And I went to my pastor and said, what can I do to have, be more celebrated? And he goes, you got, you got the best testimony of all. You haven't gotten into those things, okay? And that's still the best testimony to have, isn't it? Yeah. To, to not get into the bad stuff. And, and so uh, when, when I was in high school, I thought God was leading me in, into the ministry. Uh, again, I talked to my pastor, uh, Lester Collins. And he said, if you're happy doing anything else, you're not called into the ministry. So Baylor was so hard, I just said, you know what, after Baylor, I don't want any more schooling. So I went on with my business career. And most of you know that around age 40 is when you are you have this midlife crisis. And I went, okay, I'm gonna surrender to, to seminary because I feel like I miss God's calling in my life. And I was in seminary three years part-time. That's where I met Pastor Greg. He finished, I didn't. He had the gift of being a pastor, I didn't, which is part of the testimony. So I was on this 
search committee for a new youth director at our little tiny Baptist church in East Bernard. And um, I heard five very young men say in a matter of a week, why, did you, why do you want this job? Mr. Wall, I just know that I know that I know that God has called me to the, into the ministry. I just hope it's here in East Bernard. I didn't have that. I didn't know that I know that I know that God had called me. All I had was doubts. And we lived on one acre with about a 300 acre ranch behind us. And I literally went outside that night and screamed to the top of my lungs, God, what are you saying? Because I don't know what my calling is. And I'm not kidding you. I felt God did this. Hello, is anybody home? Your wife's been telling you you're in the ministry. You're right where I want you in the business world. I quit seminary the next day. My Cody, our, our younger son, I think he was probably in fifth or sixth grade at the moment. At that time, he goes, you mean my dad's a quitter? <laughs> Ordinarily, that is the worst word you could call me. I said, son, you're, you got a full-time dad again. And I know where God has called me. And sure enough, God, I, I just got super involved in my insurance business and got on a board of directors for our association and met a man who announced he was, he had six months to live. And uh, after the meeting where he announced it, I said, can we just talk about your eternal destiny? I knew a little bit about God as you, you know, been through seminary. And uh, he goes, sure. He is a 160 degree, 160 IQ, avowed atheist. Smart and mean, okay? But for some, he would, he would let me come by. We'd go, I'd visit once a week at his house. And I learned later that when I'd give up, he, I'd get a call from one of my buddies and he'd say, Rand, Ken wants to see you. Ken Martins is his name. And I said, why, how? He goes, I need to talk to my spiritual advisor. I went, he calls me, what? And he kept on asking me to be the preacher at his funeral. And I kept saying, Ken, let me pray about that. Let me pray about that. And y'all, here's what God did. I finally, he asked me, I was in his front yard. He goes, are you going to be the preacher at my funeral or not? I said, Ken, no. Because you're going to hell. I'm crying. I'm, I'm not saying this in anger. I'm crying. I said, Ken, you're going to hell. And I can't get up and say that as an honest man. He goes, get out of my house right now. And I did, I got up, left, and then two weeks later, his wife gave me a call. How soon can you come over? And I got there Sunday after church, and God used me that morning to pray with a young lady and her husband to accept Christ at church. Okay. Can you tell I'm bold? The lady came forward. I said, well, where's your husband? She goes, well, he's right there on the second row, but he says he's not ready. I said, come here. <laughs> he came down front and I said, your wife tells me you want to receive Christ. She goes, I didn't say that at all. He goes, yeah, it's time. <laughs> when I went to Ken Martin's house, I just said, Ken, why am I here? And Ken said, does God love deathbed conversions? I said, yes, he does. He goes, I'm ready for you to pray for me right now. Two weeks later, I prayed. I did preach his funeral. Okay. And I got a confirmation from two men at the end of the line that he did accept Christ. And when they went to talk to him about his eternal destiny, he goes, oh, I've made my reservation in heaven. Y'all, that moment in my life was a turning point that business is ministry. Whatever we do, whatever we call to do, you're in ministry. Thank you. So I feel like I'm, I'm doing God calling in my life in ministry and getting to teach on top of that. How many of you in here have ever been to a wedding? <laughs> <laughs> Philip didn't raise his hand. What is wrong with you, Philip? <laughs> so, but how many of you have ever been to a wedding of a very important person where there's a lot of, not as not many, okay, Paul has, okay. I haven't been. Thousands. Thousands, okay. It's a big deal. Okay, well, that's our subject today is the wedding feast 
And it's one of the kingdom parables. And I want to share this with you. He says in Matthew 22, you can turn to it if you've got your Bibles. Matthew 22, 2 through 14. Matthew 22, verses 2 through 14. And this is right after the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. So y'all know this is the last few days of his life. Okay. And he has already been rejected by the religious leaders. And he says, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. Can you picture that now? Okay, a big, big wedding feast. And it's a big deal. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast. And they were unwilling to come. I'm just shocked at, at the scripture. And by the way, y'all, I never understood what this parable meant until I was asked to study it and teach it. Okay. But they were unwilling to come. And again, he sent out other slaves saying, tell those who have been invited, behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fattened livestock are all butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went their way. One to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. What? But the king was enraged. Of course he was. And he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they could find, both evil and good. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But the, when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in, come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to his servants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. How many of y'all are perplexed about this parable so far? I, I've never understood it until uh, Mike, I can't pronounce his last name. Mazalam. Mazalam, okay. Uh, explained all this in this commentary. <clears throat> that the king would invite guests to a wedding feast for his son and that the invited guests would refuse to come for his, some poor excuses, it's almost unbelievable, right? Uh, it's like, imagine refusing, Paul, that you refuse that big wedding that you were invited to because you need to have the oil in your car changed. No, I can't be there. I got to change the oil in my car. How stupid would that be? But that's the way these people were treating the king. So, it was an honor just to get the invite. Sure. Not to just enjoy just This is a big the deal. By the way, I, I may not have time to, to delve into it, but early in our marriage, Debbie and I came across Zola Levitt, who is a, a Jewish man who we call a Messianic Jew, or what my Jewish friends call themselves completed Jews. He is a former priest who became a Christian. And he writes the Christian love story, and it's all about a Jewish wedding and how magnificent it is. But since this is a wedding of a king, I don't think it's a traditional Jewish wedding. It might not even have been a Jewish king, okay? Might have just been uh, a, a very famous king. But I say that because when we get into the part about the Jewish people rejecting him, not all Jews reject Jesus Christ. There are at least 10 thousand Jews in New York City alone who have accepted Jesus Christ. Okay? It's big, y'all. So, I, every now and then I cringe when I hear certain Christians call Jews Christ killers. No! No! Don't do that. Okay? They're just, they're, they're closer to being saved than you and I are as Gentiles. Okay? We had to come out of nothing into God. They come from God and they, they can accept Jesus as their Messiah, Yeshua HaMasiach. Um, many, many Jewish friends and hopefully someday that they will want to know Jesus. So 
the, that the guests would actually mistreat and kill the king's messengers is beyond belief. Why in the world would they kill these messengers? They must not have respected the king. They must not have been afraid of him. They must not have loved him. And they were very foolish. It could have been all of those. <laughs> it could have been every one of those. And that the king would send his army to destroy these people is justified, right? Um, no one would argue that it's a little strange, though, when the king invites the common people to fill the place of the invited guests. Um, when you're a king in those days, common people were beneath you. You didn't even want to associate with them. You had servants to keep them away from you. So for this king to invite common people to his son's wedding, the biggest event of his family at the moment, okay, was very magnanimous of this king. Okay? And kings just did not do that in those, in those times. So the wedding garment, the wedding clothes that they were all supposed to be wearing were actually provided by the king. At a fancy wedding like this, when clothing was expensive, they, he provided the clothing they were supposed to wear. So everybody that was there was in his provided, let's just imagine they're all wearing white. I don't know. Okay? But they were all dressed uh, in, in royal uh, garments and a new set of clothing. And these proper garments were required to sit at the royal table. It would not do for them to attend the feast in just regular mechanic attire. I'll come in my jeans and my boots and oil all over me. Okay, no. Okay. So the guests, the original guests insulted the king by not responding to his, his invitation. But now this guest insults him by wearing his old clothes rather than the special garment provided by the king. And the story ends with the just punishment of this one who was at the banquet, but whose heart and spirit was not right for the occasion. Why was he there and why didn't he put on the wedding garments? Because he was giving them. If y'all were here last week for all the baptisms, what did they give everybody that got baptized on the spot? <laughs> they gave you clothes to wear, okay? The bathing suit and a towel, okay? They provided the clothing for you to get baptized in. And this has some minor unseen realities. All parables are stories that have unseen realities. And in this parable, the unseen reality is God's relationship with Jesus, his son. This is the ultimate king, God, okay, with his son, Jesus. And Jesus had made his triumphal entry, in, uh, triumphal entry into Jerusalem but had not been welcomed by any of the Jewish leaders. As a matter of fact, the next day, he was confronted and rejected by them. This parable is largely in response to their uh, eventual rejection of him and by extension, the Jewish nation. Remember what I said though, not all the Jews rejected Jesus even in that day. What were the original disciples? Jews, <laughs> they were Jewish, okay. Um, the first 3,000 to accept Christ after the ascension in Peter's sermon, Jews, okay, okay. So not all the Jewish nation rejected them. It seems like just the Jewish leaders, especially religious leaders, okay, reject, rejected Jesus. <clears throat> so there is a slide you're going to put up, I think, Butch, about the kingdom of heaven is like a feast with the king, a joyful experience with God. Oh, well. Um, God invited the Jews to be a part of his, this experience, but they repeatedly rejected the messengers who invited them, the prophets, and they ultimately killed some of the prophets. Think of John the Baptist. They had him beheaded. Okay. The rejection of the son is the rejection of Jesus. So this parable is starting to make more sense. They have killed one of God's servants, John the Baptist among others in times past, okay? They have rejected the son, Jesus, and say, no, we reject you, and they eventually crucify him without a just cause. But remember what, I think I've said this before, who killed Jesus? We did, 
all of us. And he killed himself on our behalf. Okay, so nobody should get blamed. But in response, God sends his army to destroy those who rejected and executed his son. It's going to happen in the future, but the Roman army laid siege to and destroyed the city of Jerusalem and its people in 70 AD. We've been to Jerusalem, as many of you have, and they rebuilt a lot, but mainly what they've been able to rebuild is the eastern gate, the wall, the, they've been able to re rebuild the Wailing Wall, and there's a lot to tour under, underground there. We've been under there and seen the, the, uh, a lot of the things there, but it was leveled. Not one rock was left on top of another when the Rome got through uh, with Jerusalem. So now the king invites the common people, the Gentiles, to come to the feast through the apostles, God's messengers. All were welcome and all could come to the feast. Now here's where it gets interesting. The king provides the wedding garment. The garment is the righteousness of Christ obtained through faith in repentance and baptism. What did we witness last Sunday? Repentance and baptism. Okay. Um, I don't know if it's Galatians uh, 3, 26 through 27 is going to be up there. Um, but for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. <coughs> I had made myself a point to also read 28, 29, but all right. This is the ultimate test when you're under pressure. <laughs> I want to read this. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. There's neither Jew nor uh, Greek. For, uh, verse 27, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Think about that for a minute. All of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then are you Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Y'all, we are the wild branches that have been grafted in to the natural olive tree, and the Jews are the original olive tree. And so that's why we don't boast against them. Right now our prayers are for Israel, that God will not let them be defeated, and I don't believe he will, okay? <clears throat> that we are, we are standing with them and for them. Psalm 122 and Genesis 12, yes. Yeah. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem, 122, 6. That's right. So the garment um, righteousness enables the guest to be in the king's presence. God imputes our righteousness to us, doesn't he? We have righteousness imputed, given to us freely. We didn't have it. We don't deserve it. You can't do a single thing to deserve God's forgiveness. Nothing. And yet we've been granted it as a free gift one guest, though, enters in on his own terms without the robe. How does this apply, this parable, to us? Some people want to be followers of Christ on their own terms without obeying or following the gospel. There's a phrase that I read, in the pew does not mean in the body. Just because somebody's in church, even regularly, does not mean they're in the body. Okay. I saw a man last Sunday evening. I came back to teach that night, so we went to a little bit of the, the church service and watched some more baptisms. And this man was just doing this during the baptism, just <laughs> disagreeing with the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, okay, there's a man who needs Jesus. He doesn't have him yet, okay? At least he's here. But that doesn't mean he's a believer, because I don't think he was. Okay. So just because we're here in, at church doesn't mean everybody is a believer, okay? 
Y'all, there's a tendency to let down our guard at church. And nobody hurts you like church people hurt you because we've let down our guard. Anybody in here ever been hurt by a fellow church member? <laughs> oh, I see a lot of hands go up. Yeah. Okay. It hurts more than any. If I have a just a casual friend at the golf course do something wrong to me, I can forgive that pretty easily. I'll just never play golf with him again. <laughs> okay. But at church, when you accept somebody on the face that they're going to be a Christian, they're going to treat you like you would them and like Christ as part of his family. That hurts. And David and I still have some scars in the past from people in church that have hurt us. And we still have to say, Lord, forgive them and help us to get over it. Okay. Someday he will. <laughs> and God will judge all those in the church and remove those that are under there under false premises. That's God's job. That's not my job or your job. Okay. I don't go through the, the pews looking for people. You don't look real. Get out of here. <laughs> okay. That's not my job. <laughs> I saw them take out a sign this morning in church. Um, had to be down front. It, was, it had the Star of David on it. Even though we stand with Israel, I think they were worried that that might cause undue violence. I don't know but what, what the reason for that was. But anyway, they very quietly... No. It was, it was here at our church this morning before Greg started preaching. Okay, They had a, one of the deacons go down there and walk the sign out. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I think they're worried. Anyway, we can we can have some things happen that we're we're not aware of. So his final word in this parable, he said, "Many are called, but few are chosen." That can be troubling and very difficult to interpret, and it was for me. So what does it mean? Many are called, but few are chosen. <clears throat> you have to keep it in the context of this parable and what the parable is explaining. All are called through the gospel of Jesus. I'm, I thought I had it right here. There's a scripture. Um, yeah. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll just find it myself. I thought I had it right here. But there's a verse that I've, uh, I've written in the front of my Bible. 1 Timothy 2.4. And I put beside it why I can't be a Calvinist, and I'll explain why that's important in a minute. 1 Timothy 2 4. I'm going to start with verse 3. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people. If your scripture says men, that Greek word there is anthropos, people. Who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth? There is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So all are given a chance. All are called. Okay? I'm convinced, I don't know how many of you when you were in school, your scoffing friends would say, yeah, what about those poor people in Africa or China that never hear Jesus and they die? I t I'm going to tell you something. I believe everybody has a chance. I, yeah, it's appropriate. Let me tell you. When we were first here in the days of John Bassanio, we met Al Greenberg, and, and Al is a, is a, he's now gone to be with the Lord, but he was a, a Jew that accepted Jesus as his Messiah while here at First Baptist. Okay? But he was strung out on drugs, before he was, two Catholic nuns kept witnessing to him, and finally one night Al just just prayed, poured his heart out to God. He said, "God, who are you? Are you the God of my fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Or are you this Jesus these Catholic nuns are talking to me about?" And Jesus appeared to him. I don't doubt it, y'all. Al would not have lied to me to my face. He said, Jesus appeared to me and said, I am Jesus. I was crucified for you. I am from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay. 
And Al became a believer that minute. And he said he stopped all drugs. He had not gone a day without drugs in seven years. He said he had no withdrawal symptoms whatsoever, stopped all drugs. He became a witnessing machine for Jesus. He became Happy Al the Homeless Pal. <laughs> he just witnessed the homeless like you could not imagine. Okay. And I'm just sharing with you that I believe everybody gets a chance to, to uh, believe in Jesus. Many have been called. Now, how many of you have ever gotten a, a phone call that your phone says spam risk? <laughs> okay. And, and I'm sometimes just idiotic enough to answer them. Okay. Hi, is this Rand? Okay, it's always a foreign accent, it seems like. Okay. And yeah, what, what about this electricity or the, the solar? No, thank you. Take me off your list. <laughs> Goodbye. Okay. But a lot of people treat Jesus that way. They get a phone call from our Heavenly Savior. Maybe one of you is witnessing, and they go, No, thank you. Not interested. They treat you like a spam call. Okay. That's not our problem. Okay. But they were called. Are you hearing the, the application? They were given a call. You came to them. Debbie laughs at me sometimes. I, I've got my own Damascus Road I walk every now and then. So in, in our neighborhood, and I met a young man, of all things, his name is Ginger. Okay, He's 17 years old in high school, kicked out of regular high school, Stratford, which is where he would go. He goes, no, I smoked marijuana, and they kicked me out of school. And he's still not turning his life around. So I'm prepared. Every time I see him, I'm going to hand him a track. Okay, I need some more. I need some tracks. <laughs> but I've got a little piece of paper that I folded up, and I'm ready for Ginger if I'm walking through through there again. And I will. I'll see him again. But everybody it gets a chance, and those who answer the call become the chosen. The words called and chosen are adjectives in the Greek, and they. Are many, many are called, but only a few, percentage wise, accept the call to come to the feast and come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Can you see the difference there? And if you answer the call, you put on the robe, you believe in Jesus, and you put on baptism, okay? And you become one of the chosen. Answering the call makes you one of the chosen ones. <clears throat> And that's those people that get to come to the feast and they don't sneak in without proper covering. They become and we become the ones who are on the road to everlasting life. Those who try to sneak in without the proper clothing, without repentance, without... Now, I think y'all know, I think Pastor Greg even said this last week, <coughs> baptism doesn't save you. It is just a... Outward symbol of an inward change. And we all know the thief on the cross, one of them obviously went to hell, but the other one said, remember me, and Jesus says, I'll re oh, you'll be with me today in paradise. Today. Yep. And he, he didn't have a chance to get baptized. So no, no, no ultra Baptist to me says you gotta be baptized to get saved, okay? okay? I'm not saying that at all. But let me tell you that there are people now, and I, I hope none of you are like this, but my Calvinist friends use this verse as a proof text for their, their version of the doctrine of election, that there are only certain people that have been elect to accept Christ. Only the elect. Before the beginning of the world. And that's, isn't that, that's wrong on every part of it, Paul. And they, we, we had to memorize the tulip in, in seminary, okay? Yes. Uh, total depravity of man, unconditional election, the limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. Baptists are at least one point Calvinists. Perseverance of the saints. Once you're saved, you're always saved. That's, that's us, okay? Total depravity of man. And I got all this, by the way, if you want to get this for yourself and check me out. There's a book by Dave Hunt called What Love Is This? Question mark. What love is this? Dave Hunt. Okay. They believe you're so depraved, total depravity, that you could never come to Christ unless God elected you. That's 
so wrong. I see your look, Nancy. It's wrong, isn't it? It doesn't. Makes no sense whatsoever. Unconditional election. God just unconditionally elected you. You had no ability to ever accept Christ. You're so depraved you couldn't have accepted Christ. So God had to unconditionally elect you before you were ever born. Okay? Limited atonement. Jesus only died for those who would accept his, his, uh, his atonement. That's wrong too. It says Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. All who want to can come to him. Then there's irresistible grace. If God did call you and he made you one of the elect, it's irresistible. You've got to accept it. Okay. And, I, and the perseverance of the saints, that one does make sense. It's in the scripture, okay, that once Jesus has saved us, we are saved. There's nothing we can do to lose our salvation. Not if you really, really gave your heart to Jesus, okay? So <clears throat> I don't know why the Calvinist, but I, I've even been told that John Calvin wouldn't be a Calvinist. <laughs> that, that he didn't get as far into it as, as the people do today. The Bible does, does teach the doctrine of election, but not that way that's taught by the Calvinists. So we have the ability to exercise free will as man. Man can still choose to believe and obey God or to disobey. Jesus, uh, well, Joshua said these words, uh, he challenged the people, choose this day whom you will serve. Uh, and we see that the New Testament gives us the same challenge. And on Pentecost Sunday, when Jesus was resurrected, uh, ascended into heaven, not just resurrected, but he ascended into heaven, and Peter preached, 3,000 people accepted Jesus that day. Okay. Um, out of how many? It could have been 300,000 people that heard the sermon, that heard the call, that saw Jesus ascend into heaven. But 3,000 accepted Jesus. Uh, some fall away and come back. I think of John Mark. And John Mark, he didn't lose his salvation. He just fell away from Paul and did come back. Uh, some, according to Paul, fall away and choose to remain unfaithful. That was Demas in 2 Timothy 4.10. Uh, then, uh, then we see God chooses, but he does not choose which person will be saved or will be lost. God only made one choice. God only made one choice regarding salvation. He chose who would be the one to save mankind. Jesus. He chose Jesus, Christ, to be our Savior. Um, 1 Peter Thought I had these up there. First Peter. It's all right. I'll find it quickly. Ah, oh, there it is. Yeah, thank you. And coming to him as a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. Um, oh, it's so good, y'all. We, Jesus, paid that price. He became our foundation, our living stone, and he is precious in the sight of God. Um, Jesus, on his part, makes only one choice concerning salvation. He does by saying in the garden, God, not my will, but your will be done. He made the choice to die for our sins. We also make only one choice concerning salvation, to believe and accept Jesus or to disobey and reject him. The same choice the Jews and the Gentiles had in the first century. When we choose Christ, we then become the chosen. When we accept Christ, we become the chosen. Okay. Many are called by the gospel, but not everybody responds. And for this reason, only a few become the chosen. And there's my verse that I was looking for earlier, 1 Timothy 2.4. God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, in Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. So what have we learned from this parable regarding the kingdom? When we experience the fulfilled state of heaven, it'll be glorious, royal, enjoyable, and happy. We will not be bored, sitting on a cloud, <laughs> strumming a harp. No, 
It's going to be joyous, glorious, okay? nothing boring about it, and peaceful. Sam, nobody to make fun of your jokes. <laughs> there will be joining. We'll be all intertwined and, and joined together. And we will be one people that are working together. And this will all take place when Jesus returns at the end of the world. Um, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. I don't know if it's going to be up there, but uh, when Jesus comes back, you know what? I do want to read that if it's not up there, Butch, because it's so important. Uh, I've used this verse many, many times to witness to people. Uh, too many things in my Bible. First Thessalonians, there, I just went past it. Uh, First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. And this is where he says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Verse 18. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another okay, with these words. I've heard people say, ah, the word raptured in the, in the Bible. Well, it isn't in the Greek. But that verse right there, verse 17, we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. The Latin version of the Bible is rapturo. That's the Latin word. That's where rapture comes from. So you can tell all your scoffing friends, so-called friends, <laughs> Yes, rapture is in the Bible. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. And we know that he will descend from heaven with a shout. What I didn't have a chance to tell you all is that when Zola Levitt talks about a, a Jewish wedding, it's not like our weddings. The, the, even the young man doesn't know when his father is going to allow him to go to steal his bride. Okay, and surprise her. She has to be ready, and he's working on his house or his room for them to move into. Okay, and when somebody says, "When are you going to get married?" Only my father knows. <laughs> what did Jesus always say? Only my father knows. Okay, and then when they come to get her, in the it's usually at midnight. They always want to do it in, in, to surprise, and there's a shout and a trumpet. Gee. Is there some scripture like that? That he will come to us with a shout and the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God and call us home. Um, that that's, there's a lot of picture of, of us in the Jewish wedding feast. Uh, so we know it's open for all of us that want to answer the call. We just have to be dressed for the occasion. God is the one who provides the covering. That's Jesus Christ. God provided our covering for us. He provided Jesus Christ's righteousness. We just must put it on if we want to remain in God's sight. And God offers salvation through grace. And I like this phrase, forgiveness is free. We cannot buy it, make it, or earn it, but we must receive it by faith. The Bible tells us that our faith in Christ is properly expressed by confessing his name repenting of our sins and being baptized in water and that's how you put on the wedding garment Galatians 3 26 but for you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ okay. those are wonderful verses of comfort our clothing to attend the the royal wedding is that we put on the righteousness of Christ. It's all been provided for us. Now this parable makes more sense to me. Does it make more sense to you that why he kicked somebody out? I thought, this parable doesn't make sense. How would you beat up the poor guy for coming in dirty clothes? Now do you see? I know I do. Uh, it helped me... <clears throat> 
we, uh, we get to come to Jesus Christ because of our faith. We've been baptized into Christ because we put him on in faith. So <clears throat> I hope this has been a wonderful Sunday of worship, of coming to know Christ better. Is there anybody who has a question this morning?